We're gathered together in the heart of our nation's capital for one very, very basic and simple reason, to save our democracy. All of us here today do not want to see our election victory stolen by emboldened radical left Democrats, which is what they're doing, and stolen by the fake news media. That's what they've done. And weak Republicans, and that's what they are. There's so many weak Republicans, and we're going to we're going to let you know who they are. I can already tell you, frankly. Because we're a democracy, we are set up to accept all comers in the marketplace of ideas. When you open that marketplace wide, you necessarily invite in crazy ideas. Mike Pence, I hope you're going to stand up for the good of our Constitution and for the good of our country. And if you're not, I'm going to be very disappointed in you, I will tell you right now. Make no mistake, this election was stolen from you, from me, and from the country. This is a criminal enterprise. So I hope Mike has the courage to do what he has to do. And I hope he doesn't listen to the rhinos and the stupid people that he's listening to. Whether or not something is true or accurate, if you say something enough, whether or not it's even plausible, that seed of doubt takes hold. And it seeps in, not just in that sort of fringe environment, but it seeps into the mainstream. They said it's not American to challenge the election. This is the most corrupt election in the history, maybe of the world. It's so crazy that people don't even believe it. It can't be true. But I said, something's wrong here. Something's really wrong. And we fight. We fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. You will have an illegitimate president. That's what you'll have. And we can't let that happen. The impact of that day in, day out is to slowly degrade our democratic institutions and increasingly turn them into authoritarian ones. We're going to walk down to the Capitol because you'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength and you have to be strong. We will stop the steal. If you destroy the idea of truth, that suddenly there is no one truth, you destroy what makes American democracy what it is. This was not the end. It was only the beginning of our fight to rescue the American dream. Donald Trump reacting to reports that he would govern as an authoritarian. Trump's new app called Truth Social follows almost the exact same format as Twitter, except tweets are called Truths. Donald Trump allegedly praised Adolf Hitler. Senator McConnell issuing a statement saying that he will, in fact, endorse Donald Trump. The party establishment now lining up behind Donald Trump. Thank you very much. And we love you. And I can tell you that from the bottom of my heart. What we've done has been amazing by any standard. We rebuilt the United States military. We created a new force called Space Force. That in itself would be a major achievement for a 
regular administration. We were not a regular administration. We love you. We will be back in some form. I'm George Conway. I'm a lawyer, a conservative, a member of the Federalist Society for decades. I almost worked in the Trump administration. My wife did. I was worried about the state of American politics. I'm even more worried about it now. I thought that if Donald Trump was gone, things would get better. But things haven't gotten better because, you know, he's created a monster. What's going on doesn't really require him anymore. It's like he's let the termites loose in the building of democracy and they're chewing away at the foundations. It has always been relatively easy once you open your eyes and you realize that this is a particular personality type and that it has been repeated through history, through you know, numerous narcissistic authoritarian leaders, you realize, okay, this is, this is actually not new. We know what this man is going to do. It's part of a pattern. The mystery to me was always, why don't more people see through it? If you don't know who Joe Walsh is, he's a Tea Party the congressman, got voted in in 2010. You called President Obama Muslim, an enemy, a traitor, and you often spoke out on racial themes. The America you are growing up in right now, we are losing. The movement is millions and millions of Americans who are fed up with how big government's getting. The president in the White House has no clue. He doesn't get it. The Senate Democrats are in denial. Our kids and our grandkids are going to be indentured servants. So I was at one time considered Trumpier than Trump. Somebody at the Washington Post a few years back wrote an article that I was actually Trump before Trump. So I knew that Trump had tapped into something. I voted for Trump in 16. People back then wanted the whole system shaken up. They said, finally, fucking A, finally, somebody's speaking for me. I understood that. I felt the same way. I didn't realize sufficiently at the time that this guy's an evil disruptor. You would never abuse power as retribution against anybody. Except for day one. Except Look, what? He's going crazy. Our democracy right now, and I get pissed off at conservative intellectuals who dismiss this stuff. Our democracy right now is hanging by a thread, literally. I don't think the Democrats sufficiently understand <laughs> how radicalized the Republican base is. Michael Steele, former Lieutenant Governor of Maryland, former chairman of the Republican National Committee. This isn't their Republican Party anymore. The party has, in my view, devolved. It is breaking itself apart, and it will, it will become something unrecognizable, more so than it already is. We have to figure out as a country how to deal with that, because it's not going away. My name's Anthony Scaramucci, and I've been a Republican my whole life. There is a systemic problem in the United States. Uh, a very large group of people have disaffected from the establishment. Mr. Trump understood that. He used that uh, about as well as anybody. He became an avatar for their anger. And so now what these smarty pants Republicans are gonna try to do, they're gonna try to tap into that. Not to be overly cynical, but I do have my 11 day PhD in Washington scumbaggery. So I know how these guys operate. They only really care about being in power. They don't care about serving the people. We are the majority, and Trump won. They would like the democracy to fail if it doesn't work for them. They think this is a good strategy to preserve power. Woke is the new religion of the left. Trump now has taken us to a place where one of our parties now is anti-democracy, fundamentally anti-democracy. 
I'd be a wealthy man if I had a dollar every time some Republican voter said to me, Joe, I don't care that Trump's a dictator as long as he's giving me the shit I want. That's where they're at. We love Trump. Our generation has really lived through two pandemics. One, of course, is COVID-19, but the other is a psychiatric pandemic. I call it a pandemic of mass delusion. And I would argue that actually the second one is more dangerous. This pandemic has the potential to bring down our entire society. This is probably the most important psychological phenomena that's occurred in our century, in this lifetime, since World War II. And yet, if you look at the scientific literature, there's really not that much literature about it. That as a profession and as a society, we really have been unprepared for this moment. We will never give up. We will never concede. It doesn't happen. You don't concede when there's theft involved. I had actually predicted that Trump would not leave office peacefully. Because he is a malignant narcissist, he is someone who would rather burn the country down then hand it over to the next man. The nature of malignant narcissism is they actually take a certain glee and pleasure in destroying things. If they can't dominate and control them, they want to destroy them. And the dark side of humanity can actually be called forth by the malignant narcissist. That the malignant narcissist kind of gives permission for people to release the most negative and destructive, most evil, most primitive aspects of themselves. Robert J. Lifton wrote about something called malignant normality. And Robert J. Lifton really is one of the great scholars of authoritarian psychology and cult psychology. He's been studying this for like 40 or 50 years. He's been studying it almost, I think, since World War II. He coined this great term, malignant normality. Malignant normality is what happens when you have a malignantly narcissistic leader. The malignantly narcissistic leader has crazy, destructive ideas that would be seen as crazy by anybody. We will root out the communists, Marxists, fascists, and the radical left thugs that live like vermin within the confines of our country. But once they're able to capture a society or a subset of society, they are then able to make those crazy beliefs become the new orthodoxy, the new conventional wisdom. No, I'm telling you, if Pence came, we're gonna drag through the streets. You politicians are gonna get drugged through the streets. If you lived in Soviet Russia, or Mao's China, or Hitler's Germany, or Rwanda, or Yugoslavia, then you know what it's like to have your neighbors become infected by an idea or an ideology that causes them to come to your house and want to kill you. Hang my pants! Hang my pants! They feel a sense of entitlement to dominate others. They feel entitled to that, and they feel entitled to use violence or any means necessary to make that happen. And I think that Trump, he activated them. My name's Matthew McWilliams. I've been a political practitioner in the United States for years, run a political consulting firm. My area of expertise is authoritarianism. The study of authoritarianism, where it started, you have to go back to the 1920s, 1930s in Frankfurt, Germany. The Frankfurt School, a bunch of Jewish scholars studying what was occurring in Germany. Obviously, once Hitler took power, the Frankfurt School had to vacate Germany. One of the scholars, Adorno, wrote the seminal work from the statistical standpoint, uh, looking at authoritarianism. Theodore Adorno came up with the idea of the authoritarian personality. He was, for obvious reasons, intrigued with the question of who becomes a Nazi? How did this happen? How did people go crazy? And is there a certain type of person? who resonates to this authoritarian ideology and who can be activated. The authoritarian personality sees the world in black and white, us and them. They have nothing but disdain for you and for your values. They lecture you on open borders. They externalize all blame. They take no responsibility for any of the negative outcomes in their life and instead feel victimized. No politician in history 
has been treated worse or more unfairly. No, I don't take responsibility at all. You're creating violence by your questions. Theodore Adorno, he even came up with a scale for it. The F for fascism scale. It's predictive of attitudes that would be considered authoritarian. They did a lot of different versions of it. Now, I will do interviews with people. Within four-day questions, I can sort people on an authoritarian scale, from non-authoritarian to very authoritarian, and have a high probability that the person who's very authoritarian is going to love obedience, love order, love uniformity, and be scared of difference. You will not replace us. And on the flip side, the non-authoritarians are the free-to-be-you-and-me people. Freedom, independence, diversity, all okay. Adorno thought that, in some ways, the authoritarian personalities were very submissive, that they were looking for a powerful leader to submit themselves to. And so this celebration of how powerful Trump is, this kind of crazy idealization of him, the golden calf Trump that was at CPAC, and these crazy memes, People are getting a vicarious sense of being powerful themselves by identifying with him and their connection with him. So by being connected to a person is so powerful, it makes them feel empowered. And that 35% that are more oriented towards having an authoritarian personality, they have formed a bond with him that is really kind of unbreakable. Charles Manson is dead, but Newsweek has found a sinister new cult leader to replace him. This is all about TDS, which yeah. is Trump Derangement Syndrome. Remember the deplorables, a word meant to describe 60 million people? Well, now we got a new one. Hey, everyone, those Trump supporters, they sure seem like a cult, don't they? So you liken Trump supporters to, to a cult. Is that really fair? They've given up their lives and their beliefs to follow this man, and they will deny everything wrong he does and says. That sounds cultish to me. I'm not a psychologist, so I don't know the check marks of a cult. Um, but as someone that's fairly intuitive, there's a lot of cult-like features to this. There's almost a worship of one human being as sort of a seer and truth teller. My name is Dr. Stephen Hassan. I'm a cult expert with 45 years of experience. If you want to mind control someone, confuse them. The easiest way to confuse a person is to overload them. Sadists who prey on children are released on bail, but there is no bail and there is no bond. Unique, never happened before. Trump is a master at understanding how to say outrageous things, confusing things, and taking advantage of people. You look at Singapore, you look at other countries where they have the death penalty, they have no drug problem whatsoever. And if we did that, in one year, even if it was not strong, because it's never gonna be quite like China. I wrote a book called The Cult of Trump. It was not an easy decision to agree to do it. There's valid criticism that by calling people who believe in Trump a cult member would be offended by that. And I don't say it easily. And I don't say it with malice, because I was in a cult. I became an expert because of my own recruitment into a destructive cult, the Moonies, in 1974. My girlfriend had dumped me, three women flirted with me at Queens College, and within two weeks I was bowing to an altar with Moon's picture on it, thinking he was the Messiah, thinking the world was coming to an end. The time has come that we must repent. We must fear the wrath of God in the true sense who are the true Americans. We believe that faith and family, not government and bureaucracy, are the true American way. There are multiple ways to tell 
whether a group falls on the ethical or benign or even productive end of the influence continuum as a cult. And when people say, Steve, what's an example of a benign cult? Then I say, well, I'm a scuba diver and I spend large amounts of money traveling around the world, but I can have a conversation with anyone else who does scuba diving, even though they're a complete stranger. People can be sports, cult fanatics. I've only used Apple since 1982, and I currently own about 10 different devices. A healthy cult will tell you honestly who they are, what they believe, and what they want from you if you join. Whereas authoritarian cults will lie blatantly, withhold vital information, or distort it to make it palatable for you. A healthy cult will always honor your conscience, will never tell you who you can associate with, what you can read or what you can't read, what TV show to watch. A mind control cult will control all of that. One of the greatest living Americans, one of the great Americans of both the 20th and 21st centuries, the president that changed the country, the president that saved America. Please help me welcome President Donald J. Trump. Trump's following act like authoritarian cult members when they say things like Trump is the greatest man in human history and he won the election. When they say things that are so opposite what is proven in reality, and they're not willing to consider the possibility that they've been lied to or that that information is wrong, that shows a lack of reflection, critical thinking. How could you tell if your mind has been brainwashed or your mind has been hacked? or you've been subjected to mind control or undue influence. The people who want to persuade want you to stay ignorant. You don't need to be stupid to be in a cult. You can just be deceived at the vulnerable time of your life and indoctrinated. Poll shows they trust the former president even more than their own loved ones. And trust this politician then they trust their own religious leaders, despite everything that he has done. And I listen to all these talking heads on CNN and MSNBC try to theoretically explain the mind of the average Republican voter. They don't get it. To the average Republican base voter out there, every morning I woke up, shit was changing. Who you can marry, what you can say, all of this stuff, what gender you can be. Everything's changing too fast. The Republican Party establishment ignored these people. John Boehner, uh, 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 Paul Ryan, John McCain, Jeb Bush, all of these establishment people didn't listen to their base. Elite Washington, the elite media, all these smart fucking people who talk about who I am and what I believe every day, they don't know me, they don't listen to me. Politics no longer deals with my problems. I don't have a job, my kid's on opioids. Neither party's listening to that stuff. Yeah, there's justification in there for being angry that my political system is no longer addressing the things I care about. What Trump gave them is somebody to blame for all of this change. You have some very, very bad people in the caravan. You have some very tough criminal elements within the caravan. It's the illegals' fault. It's NATO's fault. Uh, it's the shithole country's fault. I will seal off the border before they come into this country, and I'll bring out our military. Trump enabled these folks to say, I'm a victim. Americans are suffering, and they are excited. They're not bothering to hide it. Now that you can no longer afford to drive your car or heat your house, you're going to be forced to switch what, to what they're calling renewable energy. Today in America, we are living through a wave of disinformation that we can hardly fathom the consequences. We have had years of uh, psychological warfare from Trump and Fox News. That we've now reached this moment when we can firmly announce uh, the starting of a Fox News channel. Uh, Mr. Rails is here and uh, he might like to add a few words. 
We're not starting up a reactive news service here in any way. We just expect to do fine, balanced journalism. I was a Republican. I knew as a Republican, every time I went on NBC or MSNBC or CBS, I was generally going to be interviewed by somebody who did not think like me. This is what gave rise to Fox News. The base, all these people out there, they felt like CBS and NBC weren't speaking for them. Give me, give me something that speaks to me. I think there's always been a left of center bias in most of our media. And then Fox News came along in response to that. And, and like everything in the Republican Party, they took everything and they went to a deeper, darker, uglier place. To a certain extent, we can see Fox News as following the mandate of profit. Tucker Carlson, he was the most profitable and most radical, most extremist host. Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson. Tonight, you gotta hand it to the Biden people. Demographic change is the key to the Democratic Party's political ambitions. In other words, you're being replaced and there's nothing you can do about it. So shut up, shut up, you're Hitler. <laughs> this is all to make business, right? I mean, look at the law lawsuits against Tucker Carlson. The argument that Fox made was that he's in the entertainment business. He's not an objective journalist. And so therefore anything coming out of his mouth can in fact be a lie, but it's just for the purposes of entertainment, right? So think about what they're doing. But there's also an ideological project here. The Murdochs are also the ones that were backing Brexit. It's one part business and it's one part ideological and the, the two are fused together. There is an ideological project to damage democracy. And so far right media, which is, I put Fox News and all of the Murdoch empire in that camp, it has this ideological agenda. And by the way, they're smart, man. Roger Ailes come up in the morning and say, this is the narrative that we're gonna run today. And they would thread it from the six o'clock show right to the 11 p.m. show. And every one of those shows talked about that narrative in one way or the other. The raid reportedly over an investigation into classified documents, right? But the real target of this investigation isn't Trump. The real target of this investigation is you. And if they can do this to President Trump, what do you think they can do to the rest of us? And if you express any support for him or any interest in retaining, I don't know, the rights of free speech and due process, you're a criminal too. In fact, you are the threat. How do I attract viewers and what do I have to say repetitively to these viewers to get them glued to these stations? I mean, every year we have a quote unquote war on Christmas. Do we really have a war on Christmas? I say Merry Christmas. When was the last time you saw a Merry Christmas? You don't see it anymore. They want to be politically correct. If I'm president, you're going to see Merry Christmas in department stores, believe me. Fox wants you to think there's a war on Christmas. You see what I mean? And so oh, let me get upset and let me counterman the war. And they do that because they want you to watch the television. I mean, do you think these guys really believe some of the stuff that they're saying? I mean, you know, come on, you know they don't, and they can't. They, they really believe the election was rigged. And why? Why are you doing that? CNN has a bias, but CNN is truthful. MSNBC has a bias, but MSNBC is truthful. Fox News is biased, but Fox News generally doesn't even deal in the world of truth anymore. I'm Ann Nelson, and my career has involved studying human rights, information systems, and where political systems and media systems come together. I think you could divide information into three categories. Information plans to be factual and can be documented and is presented in good faith. The next level down is misinformation. It could just be generally mistaken, uninformed. For example, uh, when I go to Oklahoma, people will say, have you actually taken a walk in Central Park? Isn't it too dangerous? They're misinformed that it's an extremely dangerous place to go. Disinformation is, is intentionally misleading. It comes from a place of wanting to manipulate people through falsehood.
The train to crazy town made an unscheduled whistle stop in Ohio this week. Vaccines make your body magnetic and spoons will stick to your forehead. This is a thing. I'm sure you've seen the pictures all over the internet of people who've had these shots and now they're magnetized. African-American communities that have not wanted to get COVID vaccines because they've been told that, that it's a plot to kill black people. Just this week, he was rebuked by his own family for pushing an unfounded conspiracy theory that COVID was actually targeted to hit certain ethnic groups while sparing Jewish and Chinese people. I do think it's important to understand that disinformation doesn't exist in a kind of unidirectional manner. It comes in through a single channel. It's amplified by politicians. It shows up on different media platforms. And suddenly it comes at people from enough different directions that it's accepted as truth. In a lot of ways, hydroxychloroquine is the ideal medicine. At this point, it's come across as pretty much of a game changer. I say it, what do you have to lose? I'll say it again, what do you have to lose? Take it. You need some kind of sense of, of what reality is or, or society falls apart. Disinformation, it's hard for people to understand it until you start using some of the terms that the people who craft disinformation use. I'm gonna use a Russian model. There is an actual strategy, a, a doctrine, that the Russians use for media manipulation, the dissemination of propaganda, and getting people to believe their propaganda, called reflexive control. It creates a meta-narrative of information in broad strokes around a target. Reflexive control is a very interesting concept where you've seen information in such a way, the decision that you've made is exactly the outcome they desire, but you're unwitting that they seeded information in a certain way to draw you toward that decision. So here's a good meta-narrative that for a very long time bedeviled Russia. The Soviet Union is bad. Right? That's a meta-narrative. We all grew up to believe that. I mean, we got Boris and Natasha and Rocky IV from that. Then we steal Matris, Boris. No time like the president, Natasha. Vladimir Putin decided, we're going to create a new narrative. Only we're going to reframe the United States. And we're going to support someone who will take the narrative that Russia is good and the relationships with the United States and Russia should be good. And we're going to help him become president of the United States. That is how disinformation works at the large scale. You can literally frame the mindset of an entire nation to where you think eliminating your constitution by vote is a good idea. You destroy democracy by using democracy. Coming to a Russian grocery store, the heart of evil, and seeing what things cost and how people live, it will radicalize you against our leaders. That's how I feel anyway, radicalized. Why is the interference by a hostile foreign power in our presidential election such a monumental threat to our nation? Voting is the key core of who we are as a democracy. The prospect of a hostile foreign power interfering and influencing the election for the president of the United States of America I can think of few more severe or consequential threats facing our nation than that one. I'm Pete Strzok. I was the lead agent in the FBI's investigation of Hillary Clinton's use of a private email server, as well as the Russian attacks on the 2016 presidential elections. I think there's a widespread belief in the culture, even people who follow politics, that the Trump-Russia story was a hoax. Yeah, absolutely not. The fact of the matter is that the members of the Trump campaign, including Trump himself, were engaged in contacts with the government of Russia, and in some cases, members or agents of the Russian intelligence services who were seeking to exploit those contacts to advance Russian aims. And that's beyond debate. It was absolutely confirmed by this bipartisan Senate Intelligence Committee report, led by Republicans, by the way, that concluded that there was a systematic attempt by the government of Russia to influence and attack our elections for the benefit of Trump, 
to hurt Hillary Clinton and that the members of the Trump campaign, up to including possibly Trump himself, understood that and welcomed that assistance. And it was anything but a hoax. There is a battle between the authoritarianism of Vladimir Putin and the democracy of the United States. And in that battle, the social media aspect, we didn't have a really good handle on what was going on, and certainly in 2015, but even into mid-late 2016. My name is Imran Ahmed. I'm the CEO and founder of the Center for Countering Digital Hate. Trump, in one respect, is an epiphenomenon. He's a result of something else that's been happening that's much bigger. The lesson to be taking right now isn't that Trumpism is the problem. The problem is what led to Trump and Trumpism, which is social media. And that's been going on for, you know, ever since essentially Facebook discovered how to change the newsfeed to an algorithmic method of ordering it rather than a timeline method of ordering it. Today we're going to talk about a new design for your newsfeed. What we're trying to do is give everyone in the world the best personalized newspaper we can. So all the algorithm does is it says, what content gets this kind of person to stay on the platform for the most time possible? Because there's only one logic to the algorithm. Eyeballs, the number of people multiplied by time on platform, equals the number of opportunities that you have to serve up ads. And that's all they do. Social media platforms, Facebook, this you know, enormous company, one of the world's biggest companies, 98% of its revenues come from advertising. So the algorithms are designed to make you say stuff so they can gather data about you and sell that to advertisers and to make you stay on the platform. And what they've discovered most gets us to engage, talk, shout, scream, is stuff that makes us emotional. That's hate content and disinformation. It finds dividing lines and it amplifies them. That's its job. It doesn't care. It just wants people to feel something. We did a study called Malgorithm, where we looked at the Instagram algorithm and we fed in a bunch of fake accounts which were following wellness um, influencers. What we found was that the algorithm kept recommending anti-vax accounts. Once you follow the anti-vax accounts, it started giving you QAnon and anti-Semitic accounts. And vice versa, if you're following anti-Semitic accounts, it gave you COVID disinformation and vaccine disinformation. The reason for that is because the algorithm had recognized in human psychology a tendency that if you, if you are feeling uncertainty, if you're looking to alternative answers for the problems that you face, you are very likely to be vulnerable to conspiracisms. And the algorithms have recognized this and now model it. They literally take us down. They say to us, why don't you take the next step on your conspiracist radicalization? This is happening simultaneously all over the world. And that single change in how we order the information in our world, how we decide what wins and what loses, has fundamentally changed the corpus of knowledge that comprises our society. Uh, Denver Riggleman, a uh, former member of Congress, former senior technical advisor to the January 6th committee, 20 years of counterterrorism experience, and very good at mixing data to go after bad guys. Bust the f doors down! January 6th was an insurrection, a sacking of the Capitol, where every single person there was doing it based on a faulty belief. Every single person was there because of fantasy. Every single person there who's smashing windows or going in carrying Confederate flags are there because they thought our government was being overrun, the election was stolen, and every single portion of that is false. Provably so. Facts-based, data-driven falsehoods. Donald Trump was picked by military leaders to run for president as a way to kind of bring down the deep state. And I think America has been uniquely conspiratorial at times. What exactly happened on 9-11? How did they know who did this so quickly like they did Lee Harvey Oswald? From 9-11 truthers to the faked moon landing. It never happened. It's all a lie. And I think that really is where social media is so powerful. Now you have this unique medium of electrons 
that can be injected right into your frickin' cranium, right into your frontal lobe, right? And it can absolutely just take over what your belief systems are because now we're in a unicast world. You can pick your echo chamber and watch it every day for hours, hours, and hours. This is where we are. Truth is being broken. Climate change conspiracies. COVID-19 conspiracy. The anti-vaccination movement is growing. Voting machines that they were in some way hacked and used to steal votes and to steal the election. The QAnon conspiracy theory is the craziest of them all. And it's also the most violent. It's the conspiracy theory that liberals are inherently evil and that they are responsible for the kidnapping, rape, torture, and murder of children. All kidnapped missing children in the United States. Pizza is a code word for child pornography. Cheese pizza, child pornography. And that they're killing and raping these children in order to get them scared so that they get a chemical called adrenochrome out of them. Now, what I just described to you minus the killing and murdering is the plot to the movie Monsters, Inc. <laughs> where the monsters scare the children, and the more scared they get, that fuels the monster universe. Refined into clean, dependable energy. Drinking their blood, eating our babies. Do you believe there's a ring of high-profile politicians who are kidnapping and sacrificing children? I do believe that. My first thought was, wait a minute. This isn't particularly serious. You know, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Now, here's the other side. There would come a day of reckoning, a day called the storm. We the people, we are the storm! And that day was when they would mass murder all the liberals, blacks, Jews, and whites that side with them. And Donald Trump stoked this when he said, oh, I don't know who they are, but I hear they like me. They say that I'm rescuing children. I know nothing about it. I do know they are very much against uh, pedophilia. They fight it very hard. He understood exactly who they were. And these people view him as their god. When they surveyed Republicans, one in three Republicans now believe that QAnon is mostly true. Q is a patriot. He is someone that is very much loves this country. Honestly, um, everything that I've heard of Q, uh, I hope that I hope that this is real. If over 70% of the GOP base believes the election was stolen, that is a QAnon type belief. And what I try to tell people is that QAnon is your guide, right? Is your influencer even if you don't know, it's actually connected to QAnon directly. Stop the Steal is QAnon adjacent or it's QAnon directed. And I think that's when I talk about the hierarchy of the conspiracy theories in QAnon, but also how sticky it is and how it actually gets into the population about this good against evil battle. Fuck you, Democrat! Why is it important? It's important because we actually have politicians that are basing policy off this nonsense. And it's very, very powerful. QAnon is so important as a baseline belief system because it's, let's be honest, it's also a Christian nationalist type of conspiracy theory. QAnon is evangelically driven. I watched the clips myself. It's first-hand information. And I think that's why it's so important to the GOP, and that's why the base really took to it. Now that President Trump's wearing the Q pen, they're playing the Q anthem at his rallies, it just completely took the Republican base like wildfire. Q's back, baby. And I'm telling you, Q is now being used almost more frequently, I think, even before 2020, So, which is really surprising to me. We're actually talking about performing violence against sitting members of Congress. That's, that's not great. Let's be honest, right? So you have a massive group of believers that think they're in this war of good against evil, they believe they're engaged in spiritual warfare. The election has been stolen by a group of demon-worshipping globalists, and there's kids being held in the basement of the Capitol. We gotta drag them out. And that's what I was trying to warn people, is that this cascading effect of crazy leads to violence. And if you have a propensity, again, to believe this is spiritual warfare, why wouldn't you take any type of action that you could do in order to remove the evil that's taken over our country. And that's what we were seeing in Chatter. Before January the 6th, I used to get asked the question, you know this online stuff, 
it doesn't really do anything in the real world, right? After then, never once. This platform gets what free speech is all about. It is really clear that there's a straight line between online hate and disinformation and real world consequences. The results of the 2020 election are all but official. Authoritarians cannot stomach the idea of leaving power. It's an existential threat. I predicted that Donald Trump would not leave office quietly, that he would try something. He tried everything from the menu of authoritarianism. First, he tried military intervention, but the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff wouldn't play his game. Then they were trying electoral manipulation. All I want to do is this. I just want to find 11,780 votes. And that didn't work either. By the end of December, they were deciding on the option of violence. <laughs> We just got a message from Roger Stone. A hoax is being perpetrated on the American people. There is insurmountable, compelling, overcoming evidence of fraud. We're being cheated. America is being cheated. I believe that they tried to steal the election. If they could steal your vote so blatantly, then yeah, I, I'm not, I mean, there's not another candidate. Supporters of the president have rallied behind his spurious claim of a stolen election. Internet battle cry, stop the steal, has swept across inboxes, Facebook pages, and Twitter like an out of control virus. President Trump, in the early morning hours today, tweeted that he wants the American people to march on Washington, D.C. on January 6th. On that day, Trump says, show up for a protest, it's gonna be wild. You better understand something, son. This is gonna be a red wedding, bitch, going down January 6th. Take it back! Take it back! Take it back! Trump supporters, this is it. This could be Trump's last stand. The whole point of us building this nation was to keep from having a tyrannical government, be able to have a representative republic that represents the people. Someday people are gonna ask me, where were you when your country, the greatest country in the world was stolen by crooked politicians? And I don't wanna say that I sat at home watching on TV and doing nothing. We know the rules of engagement. If you have enough people, you can push down any kind of a fence or a wall. If necessary, storming right into the Capitol. January 6th was a leader cult rescue operation. He summoned all of his followers to this rally. At the end of the rally, when Trump was inciting people to violence, they showed a propaganda film. For too long, a small group in our nation's capital has reaped the rewards of government. While it had associations with QAnon ideology. It talked about globalists. At the end of the film, there was Trump's face. And this face lingered on screen as Trump sent his followers off to the Capitol to do violence on his behalf. I was out running errands in my car. I didn't see any of it. Every so often I'd go to my phone, I'd see these clips. I'm in the living room, drinking a cup of coffee, watching everything go down, and I just sat there and cried. It was personal because I worked there, I cried. And then I got really, really angry. It was completely irrational. And I'm thinking, if, who would do this? Why would anyone do this? The government did this to us. We were normal, good, law-abiding citizens, and you guys did this to us. We want our country back. We are protesting for our freedom right now. That's the difference.
My name is Brittany Friedman, and I am a sociologist. Sociology is the study of society from the vantage point of social groups. So we're very good at understanding patterns and patterns across people. The United States is in the throes of multiple moral panics. People are quite frankly outraged with our public institutions. They feel as though they're not being heard. We are at a stage in our country where our democracy does not function to meet the needs of people in the way that people are taught it should. And so there's this real disconnect and a resentment, like the values of our society are not lining up with what they were actually promised. And this mismatch can cause a fundamental disillusionment. Anytime we see this mass disillusionment with what's promised, we see the rise of strong men in society who are able to take advantage of that. This is the worst border in the history of the world. There's never been anything. Millions and millions of people are pouring into our country, and they're coming in from places you don't want to know about. They're taking your jobs, and they're creating lots of problems. Now, if I don't get elected, it's going to be a bloodbath for the country. There is a wielding of language, disinformation, and just outright lies to incite even more fear than people might already be feeling. You're not allowed to have your gun, but the criminals are allowed because they're not going to follow the law. So they can walk into your place and you'll say, please, please don't do it. It's crazy. It's crazy. Moral panics are very effective in terms of gaining followers because they're rooted in core truths. We're a failing nation. Our country is failing. We're a nation in decline. And so the truth is people cannot save enough People do not have what they need for their family. The lie is that migrant populations are causing this. People feel fundamentally disenfranchised. They also feel fundamentally unsafe about their future and the future of their descendants. People become desperate. And sociologists, social psychologists have shown when people are desperate, you can tell them almost anything. Does anybody know these two gentlemen in the room? If you don't, let us know. You should Donald know Trump you know. was able to make tens of millions of people believe that he won the 2020 election, and it created a kind of moral justification for violence, that he had been wronged, that he really was the victim, and he needed to be avenged. This is going to be a fraud like you've never seen. Now, from a point of view of leader cults, the big lie is very interesting. It meant that his followers did not have to psychologically reckon with the fact that their leader lost. The big lie allowed those people to believe that he was still their hero. Whenever you're ready, sir. To those who broke the law, you will pay. You do not represent our movement. You do not represent our country. And if you broke the law, you can't say that. I'm not gonna, you, I already said you will pay. But this election is now over. Congress has certified the results. I don't wanna say the election's over. I just wanna say Congress has certified the results without saying the election's over, okay? When the GOP decided not to discard Trump on January 7th, it was affirming its identity as an authoritarian party. A party that has forsaken democracy for power and power at any cost. The historical example of authoritarianism rising and reshaping a democracy is Germany. Weimar Republic was taken apart by fascism. In the 1920s, Hitler was trying to grow his brand. He had been put in jail for the Beer Hall Putsch. He got out of jail and he started doing rallies and he had hate speech. 
and there were bans put on him by several German states. Now, the Nazi party made political capital out of this. They issued posters of Hitler with his mouth taped shut. Hitler had been canceled in our terms today. After a year and a half, Hitler convinced the German states that he would no longer preach hate ideologies. And so they lifted the ban. And the rest we know, uh, he was able to amass some broader and broader following with his hate speech. And eventually his hate speech, which was conceived in an environment of democracy, became state propaganda once he shut down democracy. When the fascists finally got into power, the rule of law was thrown out. Twitter CEO Elon Musk just reinstated the account of former President Donald Trump. This does end a 22-month ban. Zuckerberg says he's trying to protect free speech after saying he wouldn't remove content about Holocaust denial. Can you define hate speech? Senator, I think that this is a really hard question. And I think it's one of the reasons why we struggle with it. You will find a no greater free speech advocate. I was born and raised in Philadelphia. I view myself as the highest level of patriot. I've dedicated my life to allowing stupid people say any stupid thing that they want. But social media allows collectives of people to scream fire in a theater and then laugh as you trip on your way out or get trampled. The First Amendment says that, and I quote, Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of speech. However, this does not apply to private businesses like Facebook. Now, if a neo-Nazi comes goose-stepping into a restaurant, and starts threatening other customers and saying he wants to kill Jews, would the owner of the restaurant, a private business, be required to serve him an elegant eight-course meal? Of course not. The restaurant owner has every legal right, and indeed, I would argue, a moral obligation to kick that Nazi out. And so do these internet companies. The way that Twitter and Facebook was supposed to be, was supposed to be these vehicles which allowed the flourishing of democracy. But when used by people who have evil and nefarious intent, it is truly dangerous for democracy. In many countries where Facebook is the internet, authoritarian rulers have spread misinformation to incite violence against minorities and political foes. Facebook wants you to believe that the problems we're talking about are unsolvable. That to be able to share fun photos of your kids with old friends, you must also be inundated with anger-driven virality. They want you to believe that this is just part of the deal. I am here today to tell you that's not true. These problems are solvable. Facebook can change, but is clearly not going to do so on its own because they have put their astronomical profits before people. I think businesses are like gases. They will expand what they do to fill the regulatory framework that you put around them, right? And if there's no regulatory framework, they will just go bonkers. To reflect who we are and what we hope to build, I am proud to announce that starting today, our company is now Meta. Our mission remains the same. It's still about bringing people together. The window of a whistleblower like Frances Haugen is limited. I think that since she took all these documents, they've evolved into meta, they've moved into the metaverse. Most of the anti-vax crisis has happened since then. And we need disclosure of deceit, not every decade, but every time that there is active deceit on something of great public interest. This weird law passed in the US in 1996 disconnected companies from the consequences of their activities. If you're a social media company, you've got zero liability for what anyone says on your platform. That is in itself an incredibly unusual thing to have happened. They just got it wrong on this. And I, I think that reversing it is not only the right thing to do, but it's pretty straightforward. 
It's great that social media companies have some shield from liability for the content that people flood onto their platform. But where they can take reasonable steps to reduce that harm, they should take them. And if they fail to do so and someone's harmed as a result, they should be liable. And I think that simple change could reverse a decade of damage to the, to the fabric of our body politic, to the knowledge held in our society, to the divisions that have caused so much pain to so many people, rendered families apart over the pandemic, over Trump, over all the nonsense that seems to have become more prevalent in the last few years. It's time for social media to be regulated. Social media platforms are not a press. They do not in themselves generate journalistic content. Newspapers were pretty slow to confront the challenge of the internet. The loss of thousands of local newspapers across the country is depriving communities of some of the glue that holds them together. Journalism and government should have connective tissue to represent the interests of the public. And when you lose communication lines, say that from the journalist to the legislator, to the high school principal, to the parents, and you distort them with disinformation, then you have a failure. Factual reporting is now disintegrated, partly because of technology, partly because of market forces. It has affected some parts of the country more than others. We have more than a thousand counties in the United States with no newspaper at all. People who lost their trusted local news sources and trusted local, these are key words here, because when it's your community, when it's people you know and they're writing the story, there is a much higher level of trust that is shown in poll after poll. In these news deserts, as they're called, and that is replaced by what came in to fill the vacuum. And in many cases, that was right-wing talk radio, fundamentalist religious media, and other media that is hyper-partisan and, and not very factual. So put it all together, you have a pretty dismal picture. And as a Midwesterner myself, I, I have some resentment of people saying, oh, those people in the middle of the country are so stupid, they believe all of these untruths. And I say, well, you know, our media market allowed their information systems to collapse. You were so focused on your own profits, and no, you don't make a lot of profits informing farmers in Iowa and rural areas. No, that's not a matter of profit, but it is a fundamental pillar of democracy, and ignore it at your peril. Social media has played an important role. It infected our 2016 elections. It's been infecting Europe for a long period of time. And all that created a, a very well-fertilized garden for authoritarianism to grow. The study of authoritarianism, when I started looking at it in 2013, was dead. My dissertation committee, when I told them I wanted to study authoritarianism, said, well, you're never going to get a job anyway. That's because we had all thought liberal democracy had won out and that authoritarianism was no longer a problem. But we overlook that ancient hatreds are ancient and they are still with us. Democracy is in retreat. We are in deep trouble. The forces of fascism and authoritarianism are riding, not just in the United States, but globally. In this country, we're really sleepwalking through it. The current state of American democracy is a 911 all hands on deck emergency. What we're up against in America today is not just Trumpism, but a very broad based global effort by the far right to destroy democracy. And Russian President Vladimir Putin has been the head of that effort. One day I woke up, I was scrolling through the news and I saw something which hugely upset me. The American publication, The National Interest, in November 2021, 
published a joint statement by the ambassadors to the U.S. of Russia and China. Very unusual. It drips with scorn for democracy, for American democracy in particular. It claims that China and Russia are the true democracies, that America is trying to revive hostilities, revive a Cold War, and that America is morally bankrupt. China and Russia are forging a new, much closer friendship. This was heralding what was supposed to be a new era of authoritarian strength, that China and Russia would be united. I thought, oh no, something is up. Russian forces are now operating inside the city limits. I don't think that anybody can really uh, assess what's going on in the mind of Vladimir Putin right now. This is a dictator intent on conquest. Stunning comments from Russia's foreign minister reporting the risk of World War III is real. <laughs> are we in an air raid? Yes. Yeah, we are. We had the air raid. So there's another coming. Wait, there'll be three. Three cruise missile caliber. Look. Stand by. I spent quite a bit of time here in the pre-war period. The more I saw of the war going on, the more I thought, I'm done talking, all right? It's time to take action here. So uh, about a month ago, I joined the International Legion here in Ukraine, and I am here to help this country fight, you know, what essentially is a war of extermination. They are mass murdering civilians, which is against all laws of war. These are war crimes. When we last spoke, we were already elected an autocrat. The United States had bought in Vladimir Putin's choice to be the autocrat who would lead America into the, what I call the axis of autocracies. And that would be Russia and the Western European autocrats, Brazil, some of these big nations who are getting rid of democracy. Today, the Ukrainian people are defending not only Ukraine, we are fighting for the values of Europe and the world. If they gain victory here, uh, they will continue with other European countries. I see it as a wall, and the, the easternmost wall of democracy is now under siege in full-scale combat by a very large army with the intent to wipe out that democracy and thus break the democratic hold on Europe so that autocracies can flourish again. А сегодня мы видим инфраструктуру НАТО прямо у нашего дома. Более того, обсуждается вопрос вступления Украины в НАТО. Russia did not invade Ukraine because they wanted to join NATO. What he's really terrified of is a democracy on his border that's flourishing. Yesterday, reporters asked me if I thought President Putin was smart. I said, of course he's smart, to which I was greeted with, oh, that's such a terrible thing to say. I think right now, I think Russia is probably our, our biggest issue. And the fact that you have a lot of people acting as useful idiots that are pushing against Ukraine aid and things like that. David Cameron says that you should vote through funding for Ukraine. What do you say to that? Frankly, he can kiss my ass. But do you think Putin's the good guy in all this? Ever since Marjorie Taylor Greene started speaking out against helping Ukraine, Russian state television can't get enough of her. Look at all that. The Global Times investigative report that, uh, that talks about training, it's uh, from the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensics Research Lab, uh, citing that the Azov Battalion was even getting stuff as far back as 2018. Any reason to disagree with that assessment? Dr. Is this the, I'm sorry, is this the Global Times from China? No, this is... Well, That's what you read. Yeah, it might be, yeah. Would that be a reason? Uh, as a general matter, I don't take Beijing's propaganda at face value. What do we do in the South China Sea with China and Taiwan? 
we're not going to react to China and Taiwan. Oh, we got the Israel-Hamas problem. We have all this happening. And now you have the United States that can't tell the difference between a fantasy and a fact. Holy shit. That means now the United States, the one power in the world, the stabilizing power for democracies, what is next, right? What other disinformation are certain congressional representatives going to you know, ingest? Then what are they going to put out to the American public based on fantasy or based on disinformation, based on the fact they can't, that they're just trying to win in their district? That's the issue. In the Cold War, we always saw that there was a competition, right, between our ways of life. That's what the Cold War was originally about. We represented democracy and freedom and all those things, and they represented a totalitarian state uh, and communism. And we thought when the Berlin Wall came down, we had won. We had won the Cold War. Obviously, um, for now, it's mission accomplished a little too soon. Now they flipped us. There is a conspiracy to adopt oligarchy as the world government. Oligarchy is when the government is in the hands of men with means. They want power. They want to control us. They want control of the resources. They want control of the society, control of the information. What was the first country Trump went to? It was Saudi Arabia. I don't make deals with Saudi Arabia. I don't have money from Saudi Arabia. I have nothing to do with Saudi Arabia. I couldn't care less. Trump didn't prosecute them for, you know, killing the journalist Khashoggi, right? Our president boasts about having defended the person who, who ordered that torture, murder, dismemberment. Um, you know, I, I just don't know what to add. These people of money and power realize they can form a coalition and they can take over. And that's the idea. They believe that democracy should end in the West and that the oligarchy of each nation should form an axis of autocracies. And Donald Trump's election was to elect an autocrat. That doesn't sound so fanciful anymore, does it? Who scares you more, Putin or Trump and company GOP? Trump, without any question. And I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. I'm not here to, to make you glad hand or happy, and I'm not here as a Democrat to tell you that. I'm here as an intelligence professional to tell you what I talk with my peers overseas. And they understand that this could be the end of where the Republicans cease governing 100%, then use the laws to hammer each and every one of you, prosecute all of the people in Congress that they find as enemies. You think this is not possible? It's on the way. The insurgence of the Republican Party is principally because they're preparing for the next election, power will fall into their hands, and then they will dismantle government. They are going to legislate away everything. What is Project 2025? It's a call for you to come work here. Project 2025 is a massive policy document, over 900 pages, where a bunch of extremely conservative Republicans drew up a wish list for saying what policies they would like to see enacted. This is the movement. We are gonna be prepared day one January 20, 2025, to march into office and bring a new army of aligned, trained, and essentially weaponized conservatives ready to do battle against the deep state. Dismantle everything the government is doing on climate policy and on environmental protections. Taking out Medicare and Medicaid, who's talking about that right now? Roll back women's rights, LGBT rights, cut more social programs, cut taxes for billionaires even more concentrating as many powers as possible in the presidency. Give the president as many absolute powers as they can, like changing the line of command to the FBI to make it more directly answerable to the president, making it serve as, as a personal security force. Permanent changes to how American government works to achieve more than we've ever seen under um, a conservative president before. It says that all of the ambassadors of the United States in the entire world should be fired or should resign the first day of the new administration, and that there should be a focus on installing 
loyalists to the president in the critical countries. If they did it, and you can imagine Trump's cronies, some of whom have business dealings with the Saudis and some of them business dealings with the Russians, in these positions, you have a recipe for corruption on a scale we've never seen before, where the entire U.S. diplomatic corps is put at the service of one man with corrupt business interests. And they're very clear, it's a loyalty test. Like, it is about, like, what do you think about Donald Trump? And if you can't pass that, you're not gonna get into the government. And it, it's a big deal, because we're not talking a couple hundred people, we're talking it could be tens of thousands of people. They're not just talking about 25 through 29. They're talking about how they remake the U.S. government in their image. And that project yes. is a much longer tail than any four years. And I think it's important to note that in Plan 2025, there are at least two articles that actively call for an end to government efforts to monitor disinformation. And they even state, especially before an election period, Bottom line is that we need to have an army of conservatives ready to march in day one. And they're going to be equipped because of how we're training them and, and giving them the battle plan. If I had to make an assessment like a course of action on where we're at as a country, um, say you're my general and I'm your briefer. Say, well, there's three courses of action. There's three things I see, sir, you know? I would say my number one course of action is we're shaky. We're really shaky, you know? Maybe we're gonna get through. I think we might get through, but we're shaky. I think the second thing is that I see, you know, sort of an imminent decline of American democratic institutions in the next 20 years, where I don't know if we're gonna even look like this in two decades because of the bizarre belief systems, lack of education, ignorance, and our propensity to accept any disinformation from foreign or domestic sources. So, so you know what the third thing is, is I think 2024 is the end for us, if Donald Trump were to win. In almost 250 years of America as we know it, no U.S. president has ever been convicted of a crime. That is until this week. The former president, Donald Trump, found guilty on 34 felony counts. We have a country that's in big trouble. The judge could decide to say, hey, house arrest or even jail. I don't know that the public would stand it, you know? I don't, I'm not sure the public would stand for it. I think it's a very dangerous thing to mm -hmm. even talk about. Okay. Uh, because we do have a tremendously a passionate group of voters, at much more passion than they had in 2020, and much more passion than they had in 2016. I think uh, it would be very dangerous. People talk about the danger of civil war. I don't think we would have a true armed factionalism. However, there's a huge danger to democracy, which is the U.S.'s wild card. No other country in peacetime has over 400 million guns in private hands. Multiple gunshots are heard. The suspect keeps telling about killing Jews. We have for too long been complacent about all of the domestic terrorists. No other country in peacetime tolerates militias, tolerates sovereign sheriffs who don't accept federal law. January 6, participants included local and state GOP officials, police, National Guard, law enforcement, and the military. The authoritarians anchor these very eclectic constituencies and they create these movements we have to construct a pro-democracy movement, which means everyone has to be united. The 20th century is marked by a generation that understood fundamentally what sacrifice meant and what it required. 6th of June, 1944. long said that history has shown that ordinary Americans can do extraordinary things when challenged. Does anyone doubt they wouldn't move heaven and earth to vanquish hateful ideologies of today? Stay true to what America stands for. Measure the best of our energies and skills because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept Leaders, flawed in all manners, 
understood in those moments they needed to rise to the occasion that the people required. When Roosevelt, after Pearl Harbor, goes into the well of the Congress, he brought us along and said to us, I'm gonna need you to sacrifice on this one. I'm gonna need you to do some things that are gonna require a lot. And then I look at 21st century America. What have we been asked to sacrifice? 9-11, what are we asked to do? Go shopping. 2008, people are losing their homes. Buy a new car. 2020, global pandemic. What are we asked to do? Nothing. No, I want people to have a certain freedom. A million people dead. In each of those instances, our leaders did not ask us to do the one thing we needed to do, and that is to care less about ourselves and more about each other and more about the greater good, to sacrifice. Do you love this country? Are you willing to be selfless in her cause? I believe and ascribe to what Ronald Reagan, how he looked at the country as that shining city on a hill. The light within that city that makes it shine is us. And when the light goes out, we done. I don't think people understand how fragile, at the end of the day, democracy actually is. And one of the advantages to growing up where I did overseas was watching very well-functioning democracies in a matter of months turning into authoritarian regimes. And I think it took January 6th for a lot of Americans to actually understand that the democracy that we enjoy is not going to necessarily be there forever without a lot of effort. And the only way we protect and maintain and preserve American democracy is through actively getting involved. We're at a critical moment in human history. This is not something that can be put off of, you know, another few years. It can be very hard to reach people who are under the sway of disinformation. And my own mother, she was radicalized during the pandemic. And this was very upsetting. So at first I stopped speaking to her. And then I realized that was exactly the wrong thing to do. I engage with these people still every day. And I say, that's my penance. Uh, I'm trying to get them out of the cult. I don't want them to stop being Republicans or conservatives. I want them to believe in, and acknowledge basic truths and believe that Trump conned them. They have to accept they've been lied to. That's, that's where I see the light bulb go off, generally. You find points uh, that you have in common on other subjects, and you, you keep speaking to people, you keep speaking to them, as I did with my mother, and eventually was able to get through to her. You have to be optimistic that the world can change and change in a better way. And then you have to fight to do it because it's just not going to happen. You really have to fight. Uh, and we're going to have to fight like hell. And, that, and if you're fighting on that, that digital battlefield, you got to remember Mike Flynn said that they have digital warriors. They absolutely mean it. At some point, you got to drag the actual originators, you got to drag those vampires out into the sunlight and expose them. That's the only way we're going to win because at some point, you got to fight. Now, let me give you the bad news. Okay? There's no way to fix this with a short-term solution. We're not getting out of this thing tomorrow, and we're not getting out of this thing in 2024, and Fox News is not gonna change their business model anytime soon. So the immediate task in front of us is to support the only person who can make sure Trump's not reelected. But if Trump went away tomorrow, Ron DeSantis will pick it up. 
It has to be more than a blue wave. It has to be a wave of Republicans that stand for America, independents that are against totalitarianism, and Democrats will have to embrace them with open arms to understand that we are all one nation. And we need to conduct civil dialogue and work together to elect representatives who, you know, may not give them everything they want, whether they be on the right or the left, but act in good faith to try to accommodate the interests and the beliefs of the people they represent. We're now at a point where we can't afford to lose a single election cycle because the first election cycle we lose will be the last election. I know I'm not the only one to say that. If the Republicans do get their hands on enough levers of power, they will manipulate it so that there can never be a fair election again. So what am I valuing here? Do I value having cheap gas greater than I value the democracy? Do I value having a low inflation rate more than the right to vote? I mean, what, wh where are you drawing your lines here? What is principally important to you? Because guess what, America? Gas prices will go down. Inflation will recede. Democracy, when it is gone, will not come back. Whatever your politics, whatever you think about the outcome of the election, we as Americans must all agree on this. Donald Trump's conduct on January 6th was a supreme violation of his oath of office and a complete dereliction of his duty to our nation. It is a stain on our history. It is a dishonor to all those who have sacrificed and died in service of our democracy. The forces Donald Trump ignited that day have not gone away. The militant, intolerant ideologies, the militias, the alienation and the disaffection, the weird fantasies and disinformation, they're all still out there, ready to go. That's the elephant in the room. But if January 6th has reminded us of anything, I pray it has reminded us of this. Laws are just words on paper. Oaths matter more than party tribalism or the cheap thrill of scoring political points. We the people must demand more of our politicians and ourselves. Oaths matter. Character matters. Truth matters. If we do not renew our faith and commitment to these principles, this great experiment of ours, our shining beacon on a hill, will not endure.